Let me start with a brief introduction. The New Companies Act, number 71 of 2008, has been in force for five years. It came into force on the 1st of May 2011, so it's five and a bit years. And on the legislative side, there have been very few developments because the philosophy of the ministry has been let's see how the Act works in practice, give it a chance to be tested in the courts and then we'll see what changes to be made. On the administrative side, um, there have been quite a lot of changes and that's happened principally in CIPIC. That's the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. And what's happened in CIPIC is a complete restructure of their systems, their procedures, and this has resulted in a huge increase in the number of companies that are being registered. Um, and they've also gone electronic. You can also do it at the banks. So the registration of new companies is really very, very impressive what's been achieved. Also the turnaround times for registration uh, has been uh, very impressive. By way of example, for the registration of a new company electronically, it takes one day. For the registration of new companies manually, it takes four days against the service delivery standards of 25 days. And for the conversion from a close corporation to a company, it takes four days. Uh, the total registrations in the first quarter of the year 2016 to 2017 Electronic company registrations, 71,985. Registrations through banks, 9,565. Manual new company registrations, 3,313. Conversions from close corporations, 786. So that in this brief period, we've seen 85,000 649 new registrations. Also, there have been very impressive statistics on business rescue, but I won't uh, burden you with them at this stage. Thirdly, where there's been a surprising amount of activity has been in the judicial arm of government, in the courts. And in the courts from the Constitutional Court, to the Supreme Court of Appeal, to the High Courts, in every division there have been significant judgments. So what I'm going to do in this talk is to draw your attention to some of the judgments, the more important ones, that have taken place. Firstly, we start with Section 1 of the Act. In Melville versus Buzani and another, 2012, one SA law reports, 233 in the Eastern Cape Provincial Division, there was an application to wind up a trust under the new Act. The court considered the meaning of the word, quote, company, unquote, in the new Act and held that a trust was not a juristic person incorporated under the new Act. It was not covered by the definition of a company and accordingly the new act couldn't be used to wind up or liquidate the trust. It is also important to draw your attention to section 8 of the act because I think that people are making a mistake with regard to its interpretation. A and here I'm talking about a state-owned company. Clearly a state-owned company must be owned by the state. However, 
there must be a company. And a company for this purpose includes a company incorporated under the old Act, the 1973 Act, or the new Act. And this issue that I'm dealing with now is very important when you deal with companies such as the PIC, the IDC, Eskom, Transnet, Land Bank, and so forth. All of those are state controlled, but not all of those have been incorporated under the old Act or the new Act or are deemed to have been incorporated. Then it's important to draw your attention to a private company. A private company is defined in Section 8.2b of the new Act. And in order to be a private company, there must be a restriction in the Memorandum of Incorporation against offering securities to the public. And also there must be a restriction in the MOI against the transfer of securities. What I'm underlining here is the use of the word securities. Securities includes both shares and debentures. So most MOIs have a prohibition on the transfer of shares. But in order to qualify as a private company, the prohibition against transfer must relate to securities. The next issue that I want to talk about is an external company. In terms of the new Act, the term company relates to a South African incorporated company. A foreign company is not regulated by the new Act. But there are certain foreign companies who carry on business in South Africa and they are called external companies. And an external company is defined in Section 1, read together with Section 23 of the new Act. And there are certain safe harbours in terms of Section 23-2A. So that if a, a foreign company carries on activities in South Africa for more than six months, then it is deemed to be an external company unless those activities are very restrictive and fall within the safe harbour provisions of section 23 brackets 2 capital A close brackets. We next come to section 20.9 of the new act and this is a very very important uh, section which was considered by the Western Cape um, provision, a uh, division of the um, High Court in a very important case called Ex parte Gore, G-O-R-E and others, N-N-O, reported in 2013 Two All South African Law Reports, 437 Western Cape Court. The case deals with the new statutory doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. This is dealt with in section 20.9 of the new Act, which reads as follows. If on application by an interested person in any proceedings in which a company is involved, a court finds that the incorporation of the company, any use of the company, or any act by or on behalf of the company, constitutes an unconscionable abuse of the juristic personality of the company as a separate entity. The court uh, may a declare that the company is to be deemed not to be a juristic person in respect of any right, obligation or liability of the company or of a shareholder of the company or 
In the case of a non-profit company, a member of the company or of another person specified in the declaration and B. Make any further order the, comp the court considers appropriate to give effect to a declaration contemplated in subparagraph A. Although the court held that section 20 uh, bracket 9 does not replace the common law which will thus exist side by side with section 29, the threshold in section 20.9 is lower than the bar at common law and therefore I very much expect that section 20 uh, sub 9 will be used more often in practice when the formation of companies or their use after formation is effectively a sham. In insolvency, I would expect that it be used effectively to achieve the doctrine of a single economic entity. In Gore's case, the judge indicated that section 20.9 affords a firm but very flexible defined basis for the case the judge indicated uh, to give a remedy. In this case, the court held that certain of the companies in the group would be deemed not to be juristic persons in respect of any obligation by such companies to the investors. Pursuant to this declaration, the so-called King Companies were regarded as a single entity by ignoring their separate legal existence and treating the holding company, King Financial Services, as if it were the only company. The judge in that case, Bins Ward J, also referred to the following distinction between piercing the veil and lifting the veil. Quote, to pierce the corporate veil is an expression that I would reserve for treating the rights or liabilities or activities of a company as the rights or liabilities or activities of its shareholders. To lift the corporate veil or look behind it, on the other hand, should mean to have regard to the shareholding in a company, in other words, to its controllers for some legal purpose." Unquote. I next deal with section 45 of the Act. You may recall that section 45 deals with two separate issues. One, the giving of financial assistance by a company to its directors or prescribed officers or to persons related to them. But equally importantly and quite separately, Section 45 deals with the giving of financial assistance by one company in a group for the benefit of another company in a group. And it's prohibited to give such financial assistance unless there is compliance with the twin test of solvency and liquidity and unless there was a special resolution of shareholders passed within the last two years approving the giving of such financial assistance. Now, what is interesting in section 45.2 is that the um, definition of companies which are affected are not only companies, incorporated companies within the group, but also a non-South African company in the group. And this is because there's a reference in section 45.2 to quote a person. And a person is a juristic person which doesn't necessarily have to have been incorporated in South Africa. Secondly, sometimes a transaction which falls within section 45 also falls within 46 because it falls within the definition of a distribution. So if a subsidiary gives a guarantee 
for the benefit of its holding companies. In other words, it gives that guarantee to the creditors of its holding companies, holding company, then not only does it fall within section 45, but it's also a distribution because it falls within um, subsection B of the definition of distribution and it would also need compliance with section 46. Section 71 of the Act deals with the removal of directors and it's provided in section 71 one, that the shareholders who elected a director may remove that director by an ordinary resolution notwithstanding any provision in the company's MOI or in its rules or in an agreement between the director uh, and the company or between the director and the shareholders. Now this case this section was uh, considered in Minister of Defence and Military Veteran, Veterans versus Motau and others, 2014 5SA section 69 in the Constitutional Court. Um, then we deal with section 76. Section 76 deals with the standard of care of directors. The standard of care which directors owe to their company. Section 76 effectively represents a codification of the common law rules applicable to the duties owed the directors and prescribed officers to a company. Section 76 was considered in a case uh, Fisser versus Citrus, S-I-T-R-U-S, P-T-Y Limited versus Kuru Hoop Citrus, P-T-Y Limited and others, 2015, 2014, 5SA 179, Western Cape Court. This was a judgment of Judge Owen Rogers. In this case, there was a provision in the company's MOI stating that no shares could be transferred without the approval of the directors who didn't have to give any reasons therefore. The directors refused to transfer and one of the shareholders said that that was oppressive conduct in terms of section 163 of the new act. That section allows a shareholder to apply to a court for relief if an act of a company has had a result that is unfairly prejudicial to it. It allows the court in determining the application to make any order it considers fit. FISA based its section 163 claim on what I've already said, an alleged breach by Guru Hoop directors of their duties in terms of section 76 of the Act. The court held that if directors exercise a power given to them by the company's constitution and meet the standard of conduct prescribed in section 76 of the Act, then there would not be unfair prejudice for the purposes of section 163 unless there were very exceptional circumstances. The next case that I want to refer to is one that has been very recently decided, in fact this year, and it is perhaps the most important company law decision that has been a, that arose in our courts since the inception of the new act and that is the case of McCarty versus Vodacom 2016 um, the South African um, 
law reports. And as I've said, this was a judgment of the Constitutional Court in the so-called Please Call Me. Uh, you've probably read about it in the newspapers. And this was a case in which an employee of Vodacom brought a new concept to Vodacom caused, called Please Call Me. That was where both parties have no airtime available. And it was quite a um, smart invention that Mr. McCarty made. Mr. McCarty had an agreement with Mr. Giesling, um, a senior official in Vodacom, to reward him for this idea that he brought to Vodacom. The High Court found that there was an agreement between McCarty and Giesler to remunerate him. It was similar to an agreement to agree, but there was a tiebreaker. If the parties couldn't agree on the remuneration to be paid to Mr. McCarty, then it had to be referred to the CEO of Vodacom. The High Court found that there was such an agreement. But the High Court found in favour of, of Vodacom on two grounds. One, they said that Giesler had no authority to bind Vodacom. And secondly, they held that the action was prescribed. McCarty took the case on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal, which upheld the South Gauteng's judgment and also upheld the two defences of Vodacom, namely lack of authority and prescription. McCarty took the matter further to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court reversed the decision of the South Gauteng Court and reversed on the grounds um, that there was ostensible authority and they said that the matter hadn't prescribed. The real issue from a company lawyer's point of view was the question whether Giesler had authority to bind Vodacom. Now, there was a different approach by the majority of the Constitutional Court and the minority. I thought that the minority's judgment, they both arrived at the same end result, but I thought that from a company law point of view on authority, the reasoning of the minority is to be preferred. And the court started off by saying that an agent only has authority to represent a company if it can be shown that one, there was actual authority, which could be expressed or implied, or two, that there was inherent authority. Some officials have authority by virtue of the office they occupy. Three, that there must have been um, ostensible authority or authority by estoppel. Now, ostensible authority was what was really uh, occupied most of the time of the court. And the minority judgment said that ostensible authority is the same as apparent authority, and ostensible and apparent authority are situations where there's no actual authority but the principle is stopped from denying the existence of actual authority on the basis of the principle of estoppel. And there were a few judgments that were referred to. 
And I think that it's just as well to refer you. The leading case is Armour Gas Limited versus Mundo Gas SA 1986 to All England Law Reports, page 385, where Lord Keith of Kinkle said, quote, Ostensible authority comes about where the principal, by words or conduct, has represented that the agent has the requisite actual authority and the party dealing with the agent has entered into a contract with him in reliance on that representation. The principal in these circumstances is he stopped from denying that actual authority existed. And then Lord Keith went on to say that in the commonly encountered case, the ostensible authority is general in character, arising when the principal has placed the agent in a position which in the outside world is generally regarded as carrying authority to enter into transactions of the kind in question. Ostensible general authority may also arise where the agent has had a course of dealing with a particular contractor and the principal has acquiesced in this course of dealing and honoured transactions arising out of it. And then the uh, judge Malcolm Wallace in his minority judgment referred to the famous case in England, Freeman versus Lockyer, where Lord Justice Diplock said for ostensible authority, if the foregoing analysis of the relevant law is correct, it can be summarized by stating four conditions which must be fulfilled to entitle a contractor to enforce against a company a contract entered into on behalf of the company by an agent who had no authority to do so. It must be shown, A, that a representation that the agent had authority to enter on behalf of the company into a contract of the kind sought to be enforced was made to the contractor. B, that such representation was made by a person or persons who had actual authority to manage the business of the company either generally or in respect of those matters to which the contract relates. Um, C. That he, the contractor, was induced by such representation to enter into the contract, i.e. that he in fact relied on it. D. Is no longer relevant in South Africa because of section 20.1 where we have abolished the ultra-virus doctrine insofar as it relates to third party. Another very important case on authority also in the, uh, arose in the Cape High Court in One Stop Financial Services PTY Limited versus Nefenson on Vitalings PTY Limited where Judge Owen Rogers analysed the relationship between ostensible authority and the Turquand rule and section 20.7 of the new act. Judge Rogers said the sequence would be <coughs> there must be a denial of actual authority, then a replication of ostensible authority, then constructive notice set up as a defence and then the Turquand rule ameliorating the harshness of constructive notice. For estoppel, the representation must be made by a person having actual authority. The judge then looked at section 20.7 of the new Act and he then held as follows. Whatever differences there might be between Turquand and section 20.7, I do not think that the new provision in the Act has brought about any change in the law governing the circumstances in which a company can be held bound on the basis of ostensible authority. 
In the present case, it is difficult to see what scope there could be for Turquoise or Section 20.7, given the absence of evidence regarding the content of Neffenson's articles, and given in any event that OFS, OSF would not be fixed with constructive knowledge of the articles, and there is no evidence that OSF had actual knowledge thereof. Um, then there are two cases um, which, in, fa in fact only one, that dealt with um, insider trading. Very, the only reported case in our law reports on insider trading, Zitzman and Harrison and White Investments Pty Limited uh, versus the Directorate of Market Abuse and the Financial Services Board. Um, in this case, it was held that in order to constitute material, price sensitive, unpublished insider information, it was sufficient to show that the information emanated from an insider and in this case what that information was is that a loan had been granted to a company that needed financial assistance and the party who was charged with using inside information had information from an insider and he had information that a loan had been granted by the IDC in an amount of 99 million and the court held that that knowledge as to the identity of the lender and the amount of the loan was materially price sensitive unpublished information. The last case that I want to refer to um, is Nova Property Group Holdings Limited and others versus Cobberton and other 20164 SA 137. This was a case that dealt at section 26.2 of the new act and that is a case where shareholders are entitled to um, access to, a, sorry, parties are entitled to access to a company's securities register. The court held that this was an absolute right and it wasn't subject to the requirements of PIA or a discretionary override and that to make it subject to that would undermine the legislature's objective of transparency. So a party's right to access to the securities register of a company in terms of section 26.2 of the new act is absolute and is not um, in any way dependent on satisfying the requirements of PIA. So those are the cases that in the last five years have dealt with important sections in the Companies Act and does indicate how the courts have been very active in examining the new Act. One last issue that I might mention is there have been some developments in corporate governance. Um, some important developments have taken place in the United States, but I would draw your attention to a speech given by the recently elected Prime Minister of England, Theresa May, on the day before her election as Prime Minister, she delivered a speech and those, that speech 
had very important issues on corporate governance. She gave nine. She said, one, what is important is stakeholder governance, not shareholder. That means all the stakeholders of a company. It's not only its shareholders, but its employees, its customers, its suppliers, the uh, community in which it carries on business, um, the local authority, the environment, the state. Those are all stakeholders, and she emphasized stakeholder governance, not shareholder governance. She also drew attention to board diversity, and she said that representatives of consumers and employees should be added to the board. She said that there should be a protection from uh, being taken over uh, for national champions like Cadbury's in England. She said that the votes on pay of directors should be compulsory or binding and not advisory. She said that when boards devise business strategy, they should look at the long term and not only the short term interests of a company. Corporate transparency should enjoy much more attention. There should be stricter competition laws, higher taxes and crackdown on tax avoidance and evasion. And finally, she said, it is not anti-business to suggest that big business needs to change. Better governance will help these companies to take better decisions for their own long-term benefit and that of the overall economy. So that's really all that I wanted to cover and I hope that you find it interesting.